New Labour's approach to social policy. Learner outcome number three. Key developments in two areas. The aims of this session are to briefly recap outcomes one and two, whilst also address outcome number three, through an examination of key developments within education under New Labour, explaining some policies and evaluating to some degree their effectiveness. So briefly, what do we know so far? Well, pre-1997, British politics had been dominated in the 20th century by two approaches to politics and the economy. With the left of old Labour, driven by top-down socialism, with a desire for state intervention in pursuing equality, whilst on the right, new right influenced Thatcherism, pursued a belief in free market, pro-capitalist economic growth. However, there was nothing in between these two polar opposites. Until Blair's New Labour emerged, claiming to be a valid alternative to the old way of things. This was termed the third way. For comprehension, if you like, a meeting in the middle between old Labour and the Conservatives. What New Labour's third way claimed to do was bring together elements of socialist left with welfareism with Thatcherist rights belief in capitalism. However, as examined, whilst the third way appeared to be a valid alternative to the, to the uh, traditional left and right, New Labour has been viewed by some as no different at all, merely old Labour in new clothing, whilst also being claimed by some as a continuation of Thatcherism. So now on to learning outcome number three. The focus here is on education. But just how important was education to new Labour? Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education and education. Tony Blair's rallying cries in bringing new Labour to power were promises to transform public... So what were the drivers or key developments under New Labour? On Sunday I said we would be spending three days putting forward a positive vision of education in this country. And yesterday I set out 21 steps to the 21st century education system. That included a cut in class sizes to 30 or under for all five, six and seven year olds, paid for by phasing out the assisted places scheme. New targets for under-11s to master the three R's and new ways of achieving them. Mandatory qualifications for head teachers, improved teacher training. The modernization of comprehensive schools to take account of pupil ability. And lifelong learning through individual learning accounts and the University for Industry. We are continuing to campaign on education today because nothing matters more to parents in Britain or to the future prosperity of the country. And we will be making two new announcements today. David Blunkett will shortly lay out our plans for education action zones, a practical example of how we intend to put our principles into action. In areas of concentrated educational underachievement, we will cut red tape to get practical help to where it's most needed, in the classroom. And this afternoon, we are going to reveal new aspects of and endorsements for our science policy, including leading scientists promising to return to Britain if a Labour government comes to power. Under the Conservatives, a brain drain. Under New Labour, the brain is coming home. The dividing lines are clear on education in this campaign. Positive versus negative, future versus past, many versus few. As identified in this rallying speech, Blair's New Labour identified these six key areas to drive educational policy. So what were the policies that were utilised by New Labour to pursue these six key areas? Well, they can be categorised into five themes. 
Theme 1. New Labour promised to benefit the many, not the few. Expenditure has been targeted at areas of social exclusion, in particular city areas, through a number of targeted redistributionist funding schemes such as Educational Action Zones and EMA. Theme 2 saw a concentration on getting back to basics, with initiatives such as the Literacy Hour, whilst tweaking schooling and teacher training curriculums to reflect social inclusion and multiculturalism. Theme 3. The focus for improving standards was by a combination of support and pressure. For example, regular Ofsted inspections of schools, performance targets, published tables of achievement and various initiatives delegating more resources and autonomy to schools. However, there was also the process of naming and shaming failing schools, closing some schools down and various measures to enable private for-profit corporations to take over failing LEA services. What's more, performance-related pay or PRP was introduced into schools along with new types and grades of teacher on different rates of pay. Theme 4 New Labour was seen as attacking the one-size-fits-all approach within comprehensive schooling and supported the uh, setting up of new types of schools such as academies and specialist schools. And finally theme 5 where we see greater business involvement in schools. We see the pre-privatisation of state schools in England by enabling schools to function as little businesses through increased autonomies and business-like management and ability for schools to act as capitalist enterprises. This chart indicates that New Labour was spending around 5-6% to of GDP on education. But were their policies successful? On the face of it, it would appear the answer is yes, as the social groups targeted by New Labour improved their educational success. However, it is important to note that, in one key area, that of five GCSEs A star to C including maths and English, whilst there have been improvements for those claiming free school meals, the gap between those and the more advantaged has not decreased. So, were New Labour's educational policies effective? Well, on the one hand, as shown here, it can be argued that they were. However, I think this quote provides a useful evaluative balance.